Welcome. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying Unite so far. Uh, we're here to talk to you about VR. Uh, this is going to be quite a high level look at it. Um, exploring some good, good typical use cases, uh, do's and don'ts, and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, this is Matt Roper, and I'm Andre oh. McGrath. We work at Unity as graphics test engineers, so we deal with graphics quite often, and uh, we love VR. We love playing around in it, so uh, yeah, let's get on. So the current state of VR, it's an interesting one. Um, two major players, as you can see, H HTC Vive, uh, and we've got Oculus. Uh, it gives us a pretty good range on desktop. Um, we've got lots of small players, open source VR as well, and they've got a few headsets. Uh, on the mobile front, it's a bit different. We've got mainly Samsung Gear VR, Daydreams coming. It's pretty good. Google Card build, Cardboard is very achievable for everyone. It's cheap, and it's impressively good for what it is. Um, unfortunately, mobile VR is still considered not really a big player. We've got lots of little kind of quick experiences in it. Uh, not a lot of huge investment seems to be being put into it, but it is great because you're not tethered, and everyone has a mobile phone, which can generally do some decent VR. Um, tracking on desktop, you've got room scale stuff. Uh, Vive is exceptionally good at this, being able to create extremely large spaces, which is nice. Oculus is pretty decent. You can get pretty nice space around to move in, which is good. And mobile, you've got pretty much nothing built in. Third party options, there are quite a few, which is cool. Uh, but again, it's very unlikely that you'll have access to third-party stuff. Um, there are, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, so price-wise, it's still huge, which I think is the biggest reason it hasn't taken off. Big for users, uh, the consumer prices, it's still quite far out. It costs a lot to get a headset, and then on top of that, you're looking at spending a decent amount of money on a gaming rig. You're not going to be able to run it off you know, your everyday laptop. And until recently, uh, they didn't let you do it on Apple products, which was annoying. Um, AR's taking off, and it looks like it's actually going to overtake VR, which is interesting. Uh, a lot of people are, are very very interested in it, and now that Apple has jumped onto the game, it looks like it's going to become a big player over the next few years. Whether VR's going to be the same kind of level in the immediate future is unknown. Uh, there's still obviously a lot of money in it, but I think the technology has to catch up and the price point has to come down before it will be commonplace in everyone's home. So desktop VR, as I said, HTC Vive, Oculus, uh, they've got a decent resolution, nothing fantastic. You do see the pixels once you've got the headsets on. Uh, your field of view is pretty amazing. Uh, you're not, you're not, you don't have full normal peripheral, but it's almost there. Um, sound wise, we've got Oculus now has built in headphones, same with the Vive, you can buy the headphone audio add-on. Uh, my best experience still has been a nice pair of noise-canceling headphones. It really separates you into that world. It really caves you in, especially if you spend time doing audio and really putting the attention on there. Tracking has outside in, so you've got cameras and they're tracking infrared sensors. Uh, that gives you amazing, pretty much accuracy. It'll only fall down when something obviously gets in front of the camera. On Oculus, you can have three sensors, so that really minimizes the potential for that to happen. And Vive, I would suggest, yeah, mounting it on ceiling. The best way to do it is to get it up high and get it permanent. Otherwise, you'll have people walking in the way, and it just does not work as well. 
Hardware wise, it always comes down to what you're plugging it into. So, PC wise, you just throw more graphics cards in it. Graphics cards these days are pretty cheap. For something that will run VR, uh, only if you start really pushing all the post processing, doing large scenes, is where you start needing to get your 400 pound ish graphics cards in there. Um, and if you're doing something as an actual installation, then you can just throw more money and you'll get something that'll be able to run any kind of VR system you have set up. Uh, so, now mobile VR. Um, it's quite different, obviously. Mobile's a pain in general. If anyone's developed on mobile, you know it's all about optimization. So, but the interesting thing about mobile VR right now is that you can get some wide variety on resolutions. And especially when you're also looking at what graphics chips they have in it, uh, you can get some phones with the same two phones, same GPUs in them on their chips, but wildly different resolutions. So that's one thing you also have to think about. You can get, as you can see, 2560 by 1440 resolution on S7s and it's a lot of pixels to try and push on a mobile device. Uh, field of view, depends on the headset. You can get a cheap 10 pound headset from uh, probably the supermarket and it's going to probably be pretty average. It's not going to be set up well, but it does make it cheap to get into it. You start spending more money, you get something like Samsung Gear VR and the experience just starts getting way better. Um, sound wise, same thing. Uh, headphones, probably the best option don't really have anything inbuilt. No one's brought out any kind of headset with the full system for mobile. Uh, tracking, nothing, again. No cameras, uh, no first party cameras or such. No tracking for headsets. You can do some interesting things like get Vive trackers and set that up to run, but then again, you're still gonna have a computer somewhere that's doing this tracking, sending the information to the device. Uh, there are some third-party uh, companies and options. There's some interesting stuff happening. Uh, a company in Stockholm uh, called Universes, they do inside-out tracking. So they take the camera feed from the camera and they're actually analyzing what it's seeing, pixel by pixel tracking information and familiar points to give you that positional tracking, which really, really adds to the, the immersion. Um, and hardware, yeah, same thing. Depends, really. If your resolution's huge on your device, you're probably gonna be rendering at a smaller resolution. Either that or you're looking to have some very simple geometry, simple things you're doing actually in the scene. Uh, things even such as 360 video just to save. Um, but it's untethered. You can walk around freely. You're not, you're not connected to a computer, so if you can get it working with a third party tracking system, then you've got a pretty interesting setup. So yeah, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about our new um, namespace, uh, newish. Uh, for those of you who don't know about it yet, it makes the integration with uh, Vive, Oculus, and every other headset much easier, which is really nice. So, now if you go to the next slide. Hmm? <laughs> Sorry. Leaches, yeah, I'll do it. Um, so yeah, there's some pros and cons about it. Uh, the size of it, you no longer have to bring in these third-party packages such as OVR or SteamVR, uh, which is really nice. It's also kept up to date, so you don't have to worry about the package becoming deprecated or uh, no longer working in a new, newer version of Unity as we will keep up to date with it. And the nicest part of all is that it has universal input. Um, I'll go over this more in a minute, but uh, essentially you can map both the triggers uh, to the same uh, input and both controllers will work universally and it makes lives a lot easier for developers looking to develop on different uh, headsets. Uh, obviously, there's the cons of it. There's no prefabs, uh, examples, uh, stuff like the controllers that you get. You can't see the triggers inside of Unity now. It still loads in through third-party apps, but not actually directly to your game. So you have to make these yourself or download our examples that are in the asset store or online. And it can require some input setup, but again, once this is done, you're able to pretty much uh, use any controllers or input with it and it will work straight away. Uh, so I'm going to show you a quick demo that we threw together uh, using the inputs. Uh, it only took us a very small amount of time to do it. So 
and all of the code that we'll be using in the project will be available online at the uh, as of next week as well. Do you want to take a my uh, lovely assistant Andre will be uh, using the headset. <laughs> Let's see if this works. <laughs> Live so this demos. is uh, originally all developed using the uh, Vive, and we were so confident with the universal input that we have not properly tested it on the Oculus yet, but it should work fine. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who have played Unreal Tournament, will know the uh, the teleportation gun, where you can shoot the disc and then teleport to it, or Ooh. throw a wall. <laughs> So you can charge it up and then shoot it, and it kind of makes more of a fun alternative instead of uh, using the arcs or the, the usual methods. So the longer you spin it up, the better you can go, and then you have a preview camera to see whereabouts you've landed. Again, it's not the greatest system, it's just a, a small <laughs> example <laughs> to show off uh, other techniques. Don't worry, we do have an arc teleporter later, and it's a lot <laughs> smoother. Where have I gone? Back up, come on. <laughs> so basically there's a preview on the camera on this uh, arm which will show you where the disc currently is. We probably made, should have made it shoot a bit further than it does but to charge it up. <laughs> We've made it back to civilization. <sighs> so, should we uh, crack on with the uh, presentation? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now you having fun, but... <laughs> I don't know, I could stay in it forever. So the, uh, the demo there was made with a uh, simple class that we've thrown together which allows you to pass a game object to it. As long as you inherit, inherit from this class, you can uh, go ahead and tell what game object you want to be mapped to uh, what controller or even a head, and it will automatically do this for you and set up the controllers inside of a Unity too. So anyone out there who's not comfortable with programming uh, can go ahead and use this. So here's an example of uh, both the Vive controller and the Oculus uh, Touch controller. And we can see that both the triggers are mapped to uh, 7 on the Vive or uh, Axis 1D secondary trigger or primary index trigger, sorry, on Oculus. And both of these map to either Unity button 14 or 15 for left or right hand. And it's very easy to do it so it works universally on these controllers. So here's a small example of uh, the Unity editor here on the left. We have an example of the uh, enums that store the VR node type. And you can go ahead and just click a drop down and select if you want the eyes, the heads, the, the hands. It's all very easy. And then this example on the right of how easy it is to go ahead and set that up. And then we have an example code down the bottom here where we're setting both position and rotation, which is a new feature in 5.6, by the way. So if you're not using it, you probably should. It shortens your code a lot. And yeah, it's very easy to do. Whereas before, you had to mess around going through all sorts of documentation to find actually how to do it. And so here's an example of the legacy input. We have the new input system coming, or came, so if you're familiar with it, then I'd recommend using it as it's even easier. And yeah, it's very simple inputs, nearly as easy as mouse and keyboard. So uh, again, using the same uh, demos, uh, sorry, the same class that we put together, where I've made a gun demo as well, which will be available. It's just a simple uh, scene where we decide we don't like Adam as much as we say we do, and must stop him. No. Wasn't it called A? Oh, was it loading? Classic lab demos. <laughs> so yeah, we're actually loading up the Adam demo environment currently, so sorry if it takes a few seconds or minutes. Not having it. All right, let's get and get restarted. <laughs> <laughs> So we're here first. Seems like a, fam <laughs> a familiar scene from the keynote last year. Huh? Oh. Okay. 
could probably just open up and leave it to load while we talk about the next slides. So we're going to go ahead and let the uh, the demo load here and then come back to it as a uh, Adam's a very expensive man. <laughs> So uh, for those of you, who, again, who don't know, the uh, post-processing stack v2 is out now, and I'd highly recommend switching from the version 1 if you are still using it. Uh, it comes completely VR ready and is much, much faster, a lot more performance increases. Uh, it also has volumetric profiles, so you're able to enter a house, for example, and the post-processing will switch out and even blend for you as well, so you have a nice blending option, which, again, if you've tried the old post-processing, you could not do. Um, you also have easier scriptable access, so you can change your runtime, uh, like even pu push new effects to it or take some away. Uh, unfortunately, we're still missing the volumetric lighting and atmospheric scattering. Uh, the fog still Unity's fog, and SSR is not quite there yet, but we're getting there <laughs> almost. So as an uh, example of uh, all the effects that are currently ready and working with V2. Uh, the ambient occlusion is actually being pushed in a PR as we speak, and will probably be there in the next few days. Um, so yeah, there's the few that you want to look out for, such as depth of field, because um, the eyes need to adjust themselves. If you start focusing other people's eyes for them, they're going to be sick everywhere, which you don't want. Um, same with motion blur, it uses motion vectors. Uh, it's not great, uh, so although it does work, I wouldn't recommend it, unless you like to make people be sick. Uh, vignette, grain, uh, color correction all working great. Uh, except from there's a curve functionality missing in the color correction. Uh, chromatic aberration, again, is uh, subtle in VR due to it naturally occurring, but again, it's there if you want it. And all the way down to the TXAA, which we actually have running on a demo for you guys to see soon, but again, it's not recommended unless it's heavily uh, altered to work for your platform. Because again, it's motion vector based, which is not great in VR. So do you want to see if uh, Adam's loaded or? Yeah, let's have a look. <laughs> oh. Looks promising. I say that as a hit player. Okay. So here's another example um, that we will be giving away, and you guys can download it if you want. Uh, we have a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> My bad. And. Um, yeah, it's also using a um, screen space UI as well, which we'll cover more in a second. And basically, Adam's trying to get back in for some reason, and we don't want him back in because he's not meant to go that way. <laughs> so it's, it's, see the we're keeping current with current events. Approaching it's from terrible. the distance. And so this was all set up very quickly using the uh, class that we've uh, created, which will allow you to parent stuff to hands, and it will also. Um, you know, handle all the movements for you and stuff like that. So, so yeah, just a very quick demo of uh, stopping Adam from getting back in. Because, <laughs> and we actually, uh, while doing the uh, ragdoll for the Adam, we messed it up so that when he shot him, he would instead fly at you. And it was a lot more scary, but <laughs> we didn't feel it was very fitting. So, <laughs> unfortunately, we have no audio as well. But apart from Andre's ears being blasted currently. So anyway, shall we uh, move on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm getting so, creep creeped out by Adam's. So. Um, we did a few hacky things in the scene here as well uh, to get instancing working on the Adam mesh itself. Uh, so the Adams that are further away in the distance were actually cut up and then um, parented back to the rig, but aren't using uh, skin mesh renderers, so that we were able to use uh, GPU instancing as well just to speed it up a bit for VR and get a good stable frame rate even on a laptop. Right, Andre. <laughs> right, go back to press station. Yeah. <laughs> that gun is too loud in there. <laughs> Apparently, it's funner than it looks. So, uh, there's a few techniques for uh, UI that I'm sure if you've made VR before, you've experienced uh, issues with it, such as. Uh, Using screen space, it, the, it just won't pick it up. It won't because the way uh, it's rendered. Um, the headset lens are rounded, so the first time I used uh, a headset, I tried to make a square UI, which is actually on the camera currently. And I put the headset on, and I was like, I'm an idiot. The, le the lens is around, so this, how can I see corners? 
So there's a lot of stuff you have to look out for for this and get creative. So currently the camera is using a cam canvas on it. Um, so there's stuff like this which we'll cover. But and world space is usually the most common one. This uh, canvas is currently in world space, as was the UI on the gun. And yeah, it's also get creative with 3D UI and using gaze style UIs. So uh, we've got a good case study here from a uh, workmate. Um, in making a game, you make space stations it's on mobile, VR, which is insane. Uh, hats off to them. Um, and they're running into big issues with the UI. Obviously, uh, in VR, you're rotating around the spaceship, space station. Uh, you've got a lot of detail, a lot of information, a lot of separate UI parts. And because it's all moving with you, with the camera, uh, the batching just breaks instantly. Um, you, so they had to do some interesting things. Um, because draw calls were obviously an issue. Um, as here you can see, uh, the individual parts of the UI which make it up, there's tons of little bits. All these are actually separate canvases. So it just killed performance. Uh, the cockpit itself wasn't in a fixed position because you're moving around. So their solution was to have two versions. They had one that was way off outside of zero to zero and it was purely the renderer. They had all the actual canvas renderers on it and then they had another duplicate version of it that was attached to the camera as you're moving that had no renderers but had all the functionality, had all the button components, had all the toggle components, everything. Had all the logic to make it work. So the stuff off to the side was set static, it could get batched, it didn't cost anything to render and then that just got rendered on top of the view that you were seeing. Whereas all the interactive parts of the UI were still in the right place as you moved around because they were still there attached to the camera moving in real time. So this was good because it saved draw rules due to it being static and the code had to be changed massively which was a big, big effort for them. Um, in the end they decided it was worth it for this particular game just because it was so heavy on UI components they needed, it was the only way they could figure out how to do it and they had to do it quickly and the solution worked first time around. Um, but they had to choose obviously whether it was worth you know, putting that extra effort in to change the code to make sure they got rid of draw course. Um, the other issue they found was, was not so much VR related, but because of the heavy UI they had was garbage collection. Um, they found out because they were changing, constantly changing a bunch of text components on the UI, uh, it was just piling up in the background. And it's something you really don't think of when you're just writing out code and you're like, oh, I'll put this text equals this stat on my character or this information that I'm getting. But it kills it. So what they ended up doing was change the code uh, and just obviously update it when it actually changed instead of updating it all the time. So it was a simple change, but it's something that slipped their mind while they were creating it. Um, and that saved heaps. So now we go on to the foliage demo. Yes, yeah, so we have a uh, demo put together by Awesome Technology Vegetation Studio, which is currently running great in VR. I'll um, we'll show you a quick demo for this as well. You can actually shut the Unity editor now. So this demo is actually using a temporal anti-aliasing, which we, is very apparent on the projector, uh, around the edges especially. However, when playing in VR, it's uh, not as apparent at all. Um, I'm going to talk about over some of the uh, technology behind what he's done to allow us to have such dense foliage, because um, it's actually huge uh, in distance, and actually a lot of it's being rendered behind it, as well as being able to recalculate 
the environment in real time. This is actually all being recalculated at real time without any saved profiles or information uh, through different profiles. And it's all running in uh, VR with uh, post processing and uh, again mentioned TXAA, which generally is frowned upon, but it's working pretty pretty damn well. So let's just go over the slides now. To uh, can you uh, back on? So part of this VR, uh, VR optimizations. So all the trees are instanced, uh, rendered, uh, including the stones. Uh, there's instant indirect for grass rendering, close to zero CPU usage in the rendering loop, which allows us to go ahead and use other stuff, maybe procedural, I don't mind, I don't know, well, whatever you guys want to get up to. Um, trees, billboards orient against the camera position, not the orientation. Uh, this has also recently been upgraded uh, with particles and trail renderers and Unity as well, so they're all VR compatible. Um, so we get no strange movement when turning the head because it knows where to look. Uh, the tree billboards are batched together in meshes up to 10,000 per draw call and all vegetation cold and cells using culling group API, no overhead for game objects as well, which allows insanely fast performance and capable for VR, triple A looking scenes. So uh, some just general VR optimizations. Uh, single pass stereo obviously is great. Uh, Obviously, some post-processing doesn't work for it. Uh, it's not as amazing as you may think it is. It does speed up time, but it doesn't act. The, the idea of it cutting your draw calls in half, that's not actually what it's doing. What it does is render the same object for both eyes at the same time, rather than rendering all the objects on one eye and then rendering all the objects again on the other eye. It does them in pairs, so the actual switching from object to object happens only once instead of twice, once for each eye. It happens after it's rendered both eyes for that object. Uh, mirror mode is great if you're doing things like 360 video because what mirror mode does is essentially just copy one eye onto the other one. You don't have to render anything again. Um, so if your source isn't 3D and you don't need the depth perception, then use mirror mode. Uh, it's actually hidden on the camera component by default. So either access it by code, or you can put the inspector into debug mode and it will pop up there as a tick box. Um, VR setting render scale and VR render viewport scale uh, scales down the actual rendering. So talking about very high resolution mobile phones, chuck down your render scale, you're not gonna notice it and it can save you a lot of, a lot of performance you can also go the other way if you've got a lot of performance to spare. Instead of worrying about anti-aliasing, you can actually chuck that render scale above one and then you'll get more pixels. Essentially, it's super sampling. Um, obviously, any general optimizations apply as well. Things, obviously, batching, GPU instincts are great. Uh, it's supporting on majority of platforms now, which is a good thing. Efficient shaders, that's something I can't stress enough. As soon as I learned how to write shaders, it blew my mind. Like, it makes a huge difference. Um, using things like vertex colors to do simple colors, rather than having to have textures. Good. Using cutout with dithering on transparencies, so you're not actually rendering everything as an actual uh, semi-transparent. It's fully opaque. You're just not rendering the odd pixel. Fallout 4 did this really well. They did it for all their grass and all their foliage. So even though it looks soft, if you look up really close enough, you actually see it's just rendering a full bit of vegetation, then nothing, and it's just doing that. It's a stippling effect to give you that variant of transparency. Uh, bake it all. Bake as much as you can. Um, in VR, you can get away with it quite a lot because generally your area of movement's quite limited. So you're never going to be able to go all the way around that corner and see what's going on. You could bake it all down. Mesh-wise, again, anything after 20, 50 meters, you're not going to actually notice the depth perception in it. So it could be cards. 
and you can get rid of a lot of geometry and shading. And then profile, profile, profile. <laughs> it'll, it'll show you a lot. And if you can, always do it on the device. Um, the editor isn't 100% reliable for profiling, and I would always recommend doing it in builds. Do we have audio? <laughs> so we actually don't have audio. Um, it was a pretty cool demo anyway, I think. Yeah, I showed the demo. It was a demo to show off spatial audio in uh, Unity. So it creates the effect of your earlobes, essentially. So it will change the way the audio comes into each ear based on the angle your feet getting it from. And it's, it, when it works and you've got nice headphones on, it's super immersive. It creates an amazing level. And again, all the um, demos will be online and available as of next week, so I'd recommend go, going home and trying it out because it does look really cool and it sounds even better. So as you can imagine, you'll be looking around and there'll be all sorts of crazy whale noises and stuff going on. <laughs> and this uh, actually runs smoothly on mobile as well, so there's a lot of optimization techniques that have gone into it to get it all running nice and smooth on mobile as well. So if you're looking to create VR for mobile as well, there's some cool stuff in there to learn from. It sounds really cool. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> so a VR cheat sheet. Um, these are just little bits uh, that you should always not do, essentially, or oh, and things you should do. If you're moving people instantly, never just instantly move them. If you appear somewhere else that you weren't a second ago, it's very disorientating. Anyone that's actually tried VR will know this if it's been done badly and it's not a good experience. So always try and fade away to black or white and fade again. Um, the user should always activate anything, really, especially movement, because if you start moving a person without their knowledge of what's going on or how they've gotten to this point of moving, it's gonna confuse them. It's gonna cause that motion sickness. You're gonna start leaning. It's not a good feeling. Frame of reference helps us hugely. Um, things like Eve, Valkyrie, where you've actually got the cockpit always stuck around you, and that's not moving in space, but you're flying through space, and it feels fine. And that's because there's always something there that you can look at and go, I'm not flying through space at 1,000 miles an hour. Um, vignette also helps us. This is what a few companies have started doing, as creating quite a heavy vignette around the user. This makes sure that what they're just seeing right in front of them that's all they have to really focus on. They're not seeing super fast things flying around in their peripherals because it gets faded out. Uh, and make things to scale. It seems like a real simple thing. Uh, I've done 3D for a very long time, and I've always liked the idea of making things to real world scale. If there's a chair, make it chair height. Don't make it the size of a building. Because as soon as you get into VR and things are out in scale, it'll just seem weird. It'll always feel odd. and it just isn't a good experience. It takes a long time to convert the project, especially if it's a large one, Yes. to be in VR scale. And then you have to decide whether you're scaling everything down or you're trying to fake the camera being a lot bigger. Um, which brings us to the don't do's, and which is never scale the camera. Because scaling the camera will actually scale the eye distance. Um, so it's good if you want to, by design, make a person feel like a midget you can then just scale the camera down and put it here on this bit of table and you'll be like, oh, I'm tiny. And that's good. But don't scale it down if, you're stand if you want someone to be standing here because they'll feel like they're floating above this giant world. And that's something that can get lost, especially if you've got a camera attached to, say, a character and you've scaled the character somewhere at some point, and that'll throw everything out in terms of the distance. Uh, place the player at the correct height. Um, you don't want to be floating. You don't want to feel like you're going to be fall. You want to be at the same level you would be normally. Generally, you can get away with 1.7 meters, 
and that's a pretty comfortable height. You can generally get everyone feeling okay with that. Otherwise, ask the player how tall they are. And it's easy enough to just scale that in your code and have you know, at an adjustable height. Uh, certain things is whether it's sitting, whether it's standing, figure out them. Certain uh, VR things such as the Vive does a good job at this. It already knows how far it's off the ground because you've already calibrated it. You don't have to worry about it. Mobile VR, it's a bit different. The camera doesn't get offset. So you have to account for that. And yeah, again, never instantly move the camera. And if you do, do the fade because it will disorientate people. So future of VR, uh, it's looking bright. I did get all, no, it's going to go downhill and AR is going to win. But VR is always going to be around, and it is the future. Even though the technology is not quite there and it is expensive right now, it, it's, I mean, if anyone's read Ready Player One, it's the future. Script will render pipeline is going to help massively here. Uh, you've probably heard us talk about it a bit and saw a shiny demo at a, the keynote yesterday. It's cool. It's very powerful. And it opens up a huge, huge area of optimization, which is perfect for VR. And we are actually going to be supporting VR in all the pipelines that we release. So we'll be happy with that. Uh, Cross Reality Foundation Toolkit is coming out. And the work on that is going well. And that's going to help bring everything together. It's going to make it a lot easier to do all the controls do all support for all the different types of HMDs you'll have. And it's just going to make life generally easier if you're developing for VR. Uh, Metal 2 is coming out on OS X, so Apple's finally getting in the VR game. Support's going to be great. Uh, if you've got a laptop, you have to buy a giant, giant GPU. But if you're getting one of the new shiny iMacs, then you can just run it straight off the bat. But what I'm finding really interesting is the AR kit. And I've, even though this is a talk about VR, I think the AR kit can actually be used to do tracking, positional tracking for VR, because it uses the camera. It figures out surfaces, it figures out where you are, it figures out real world scales, gives you lighting information. And it's only a slight tick box away from going, oh, I'm going to render something to VR on the screen rather than sending through the AR camera. And there you've got the first actual mobile device that has full inbuilt tracking for positional data, which is pretty cool. Um, mobile devices, they're getting more and more efficient. Batteries are getting better. Heat's getting less. Screens are getting better quality. And they're actually getting more high res than the displays that you'll get in desktop HDMDs. So it's only a matter of time before we start getting really nice mobile VR. And it's going to come up to the same level, I reckon, eventually, because everyone likes having a mobile device, and there's a lot of money in it. So it's only going to get better. And next round of HMDs for desktop, I think, are going to be a lot cheaper. We're waiting for them. They've been out for the, quite a while now, what we've got currently. So it's just a matter of time waiting for Oculus or Vive come out with something new and shiny, something with a lot more resolution, something that's a lot better price point. And wireless. Hmm? And wireless. <laughs> So yeah, here's uh, the links um, where the projects will be available. You can go ahead and download it off my uh, GitHub as of next week. Uh, we still have a, fi a few more alterations to make to comment, code commenting, stuff like that. Um, and some other helpful links such as optimization and the VR Learn site as well. So we cover everything in there if you are new to VR. And a special thanks to uh, these guys for helping us out a lot. Uh, Nicholas, he's a uh, the scene with the camera is actually for uh, an early work in progress from a VR game that he's currently making in America, that which is uh, helping raise, raise awareness for a very violent area in New York. And yeah, he's pretty much throwing all his money into it and getting nothing out of it, so other than helping lives, of course. And uh, Leonard for the um, awesome technology uh, terrain system. It's uh, really awesome. Highly recommend uh, checking it out. Uh, he's currently doing a beta test for people that want to get in on it. I do highly recommend it, especially if you're working in VR. And uh, Ignacio and Sophie for both helping us out with the uh, levels and case studies. Thank you.